And you have some handouts there. I have, I have some notes that I placed on the handouts. You're welcome. Hopefully you, you put that to use. And if you want to make notes, I encourage you to do that. But I'm going to be reading tonight from the King James rendering. And so we'll start in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. And the scripture reads, um, Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now, we're going to get into a segment of, 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 of this particular aspect of the letter where Paul is going to deal with some heavy issues because as we talked about the church, we understand that the church of Philippi, which is the letter to, uh, to the Philippians, this church started uh, in Macedonia. It was a Roman colony, and Paul and Silas went there uh, to, to preach the gospel and to start a church. And while they were there, um, they got into a situation where the businessmen of that particular area rose up against them, and they were thrown, they were beaten publicly first, and then thrown into jail, put into the stocks. In other words, you could say they were miserably and horribly treated for doing what? Preaching the gospel. Right. Now, when that happens, um, uh, we, we have it recorded in Scripture in Acts chapter 16 that they were, after they had been beaten, the Bible records that at about midnight, they were praying and singing praises unto God, and the power of God hit that place, and, the, and there was a, a mighty earthquake. It caused the, the jail doors to swing open, and, and literally all the prisoners could walk out. And the jailer came in thinking that his life was over, and he asked Paul and Silas, uh, uh, what shall I do to be saved? And so that started that church there. And, of course, there was Lydia that they had, Paul and Silas had met earlier. And so what the point here is that this church was started out of great, uh, a great time of persecution. This was a difficult area to live in as a Christian. And so Paul writes to them, and he's comforting them because they had some special times together. And we said this before, but here's the thing. When you walk through tough times with people, there is a bonding that grows in that. Something dynamic happens when you go through things with people and it's tough times. You get to know people like you never would know them otherwise. And so that's the story with this church. Now he gets to this particular segment of the letter. Now he's going to begin to warn them. Because here's the thing about the church. When you, when you read the New Testament, specifically the letters of the New Testament that Paul writes, and also the other writers such as James and and Judas and um, uh, Peter, they talk about this particular thing, and that is that the church is threatened. There's something that constantly seems to threaten the church. And you understand when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the members, the members of the body of Christ, the people. And there's something that seems to constantly threaten the people of God. And we will find out tonight that that thing is false doctrine or false teaching. If I could make it plainer, I could say it like this. That which takes away from what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. That which takes away from that, and the Bible refers to that as a lie and as anti-God. So we're going to look at tonight because we're going to see him say some very strong things in regards to false teaching. And I, and I want to say this to you also. This letter was written in the first century. Here we are in the 21st century, and guess what? We are just as threatened as ever before in the history of the church with false teaching. Literally, because of the technology that we have available to us today, we are bombarded with false teaching 24 hours a day. Because you have so many means to listen and see people saying all kinds of things. So we're going to be able to learn something tonight about this issue of false teaching, how important it is. And let me say this about false teaching. What false teaching does, what does it do? Well, first of all, false teaching, it gets into your mind and it deceives you. What is deception? Deception is when you think you're right and you're completely wrong. It twists your thinking. And when it twists your thinking, what it does, it pulls you away from what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, you could say it this way. It pulls you away from the source of life and power. And then you become captured by demons. 
And of course, the ultimate uh, side of that is to cause you to be left out of God's presence forever. So one of the most dangerous things that can threaten the church is false teaching. And see, this is why we're here tonight. Because how do you battle false teaching? You battle false teaching with true teaching. Does that make sense to you? Yes. If you don't get the truth, then the false would take over. So that's why we're going through the Bible in this particular case, verse by verse, because here's, here's the safety. You get to open up your Bible. You get to look at it with your eyes. You get to go home and study it and check it out. And so there are, there are safety features set up. Do you, see, do you see that? It's not just the fact that you hear somebody who, who just utters some words, and, and if they can do it pretty good, if they have a pretty, pretty good oratory skills, and if they can use some words and say things and say it in a certain way, just sort of captures your mind. No, you get to see it for yourself. Oh, isn't that good? Yeah. Oh, that's good stuff there. Yeah. You are not the mercy of any man. Okay. All right. So if you look at the notes still on the, fir the first slide, uh, what, the, what the scripture is showing us there, let me get myself organized here. He says there, Finally, brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it's not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now, look at the notes that I put there, if you would, please. Why rejoice in the Lord? Because the life of the believer is never based upon the circumstance, but always should be based upon what Jesus has accomplished for them through his death, burial, and resurrection, and their daily communion with him. In this world, circumstances are not consistent. There are days that are good, better, and best, and sometimes just not so good from a natural standpoint. So here's the thing. He says to the church here, he says, you, you are to what? Rejoice. What does that mean? It means that the Christian life is not subject to just what is happening from a natural standpoint in my life. I must understand that the, the Christian life is the life of Christ which supersedes, goes beyond that which is happening to me, happening to me in the natural. The tendency is for people is to become bogged down in that which happens from the standpoint of the circumstances of life. Here's the reality. Do you know life happens? Good, bad, ugly? Life happens. Regardless of your ethnicity, life happens. If you live on the earth long enough, eventually life is going to happen. Something that you did not expect, something that you did not know was coming, life is going to throw a curve at you. It's going to happen. That's reality. So therefore, the scriptures teach us that we are called, what, to live beyond it. What does he say? He said, regardless to what happens, rejoice anyway. Okay, that's victory right there. Because see, here's the thing. If regardless to what happened, I can rejoice. Why can I rejoice? I can rejoice because Jesus is Lord, and he has conquered, and because I'm in him, whatever I'm dealing with, I'm going to go through it, but I'm going to come out the other side somehow, someway, victory. Victorious. So therefore, I can rejoice. Now, if I'm not in Christ, I'm, I'm left by myself. And I can't rejoice. But I can rejoice because there's someone greater than I am who's taken me through. So he says rejoice. Let's look at verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs. Now, we're getting to some heavy language here. You start calling people dogs. That's serious stuff there, right? That's fight words. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those, those mutilators of the flesh. If you look at the notes right under that, and you, you, if, the, if you were here last week, you see that I'm reviewing just a little bit. I like to review just a little bit. He says, during the first century, dogs would roam the streets in, the, in large packs as scavengers. The Jews would normally refer to the Gentiles as dogs. Now Paul is referring to the Judaizers, or you could say the Jews, as dogs. What a twist. So here's, here's the deal. Um, in Judaism, and when we talk about Judaism, we're talking about Jews, we're talking about those who had a covenant under the Abrahamic covenant with God. They were the ones who were given the Mosaic law. They were the ones who were given the, the covenant that, that, uh, that God made with Abraham. They were considered the blessed people on earth. But it was given to those who were Jews. Anybody who was a non-Jew was considered what? Outside of the blessings, 
outside of the covenants of promise, outside of that which God had, was doing at that particular time, and they were considered a non-blessed people, so the Jews looked at them as what? Dogs. It's not nice, is it? But that's where the term came from. If you were not a part of the Abrahamic blessing, you didn't have a God on your side. So you were just in the world, so the scripture says, in the world, without God, without hope. Oh, I'm so glad things have changed. Amen. So the Jews looked at all non-Jews as dogs. So much to the point, now you understand that's racism, correct? Uh -huh. So much to the point that in many cases, if a Jew, if he, he was a real orthodox Jew, if he was walking on, on the side of the street and there were some Gentiles coming toward, guess what he would do? He would go to the other side of the street. Why? Because he could not allow such dogs to get close to him. Might rub off on them. Dogs. Now, here, here's the profound thing. Because Paul, who was a Pharisee at one time, he turns the table, and now he's calling the Jews, or the Judaizers, or those who considered themselves blessed, dogs. Now, you can imagine the Jews who heard that. That would make them bawling mad. Because the people that they had called dogs for centuries, he was referring now to them as dogs. Let's look at why, why is he referring to them as dogs? Here's another point. The Judaizers promoted themselves as holy and righteous people. However, because they attributed their righteousness to their ability, flesh, we're going to find out more about this term, flesh. To keep God's commands, the law of Moses, and try to discount and diminish the redemptive work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit through Paul saw this as the greatest type of wickedness. Here's a key point right here, and I'll keep referring to this. Anything that takes away from what Jesus Christ did in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection is wicked and evil in the sight of God. Now, we're, we're going we're to expound upon this, but that's, that's a key issue. And see, that is very relevant in our day because any preacher, any pastor, regardless of the size of the church, regardless of how slick the suit look, or slick back the hair is, or regardless of how much money they have, but if they take away from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and see that there's another way, there's another emphasis, there's something else that's more important, that is wicked. Did you know that wicked things don't always look wicked? In fact, if they did, people would leave them alone. But because they don't look wicked, they deceive us and people get involved in them. Am I right? Yes. So Paul is saying the Judaizers, the ones who, who pretend to keep the law of Moses. And see, here's the thing with the Judaizers. The Judaizers were saying to those who were now coming to Christ, they would say, that's not good enough. Coming to Christ is not enough. No, you need to keep the law of Moses. You need to keep the Ten Commandments, the 613 ordinances. You need to keep it all. And on top of that, if you're a male, you need to be circumcised. Aren't you glad we live on this grace? <laughs> God help us. So that was, see, so they were what? They were distorting the gospel. They were saying that you don't just need Jesus. You need to do something. There's the key right there. You need to do something. There's something you have to do. And what we're going to find in our discussion tonight is that when it comes to Jesus, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Nothing. Now, that's hard for humans to hear. Because humans like to do what? Do. Why? Because it makes us feel good. It causes us to feel prideful. To be able to say, this is what I did. This is the reason why I'm a good person. This is the reason why I'm a good citizen. This is the reason why I'm better than them. 
are better than him or her. This is the reason. And the core of that is pride. Well, you listen to. Okay, let's move on. So he, he calls them dogs in verse 2. Look at verse 3. He says, for we are the circumcision. Now, now we start to break down some terminology because I don't just want us, obviously this is a Bible study, right? It's not a Bible reading, correct? So if you study, the difference between study and just reading, reading, it takes you on a certain level, but study takes you deeper. And I've said this to you before. In the context of study, what that means is that you dig. If you're studying, you dig. What does that mean? I'm trying to collect as much information as possible, right? That's what study is. So in study, you have to do some word studies. Sometimes you have to look at things from a historical context, sometimes in a geographical context. Why? Because you're collecting information. That's how you study. You don't study, you know, half asleep. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's look at this word circumcision right there in your notes. Look with me if you would. This was the cutting of the foreskin on the male organ. And what did it mean? In Genesis chapter uh, 17, would you turn over there real quick? Just to do, because we are studying, correct? Yes. So it's okay to turn in your Bible if you're studying, correct? Go back to Genesis chapter 17. Let's look at this reference point here as to this initiation of this um, term that has to do with circumcision. In Genesis chapter 17, and remember, I'm reading from the King James reading. In your Bible, if you don't have the King James, uh, it's going to read a little bit different. But look with me in Genesis chapter 17, and look, I'm going to look at, I'll pick up verse 10 first. Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. This is the covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be what? Circumcised. Now, this circumcision is a physical thing. This is, not, this is something that had to be done. Somebody had to get cut. Okay, we won't, we'll, because we have a mixed audience, we won't go any more deep in detail than that, all right? Verse 11, and ye shall circumcise who? The flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. What does that mean? It's saying that this idea of circumcision, it was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. Does that make sense to you? Let's keep reading. Verse 12, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised. What does that mean? It means that every male child, when that child becomes eight days old, the cutting begins. Eight days old. You notice when Jesus, uh, when he was taken to the temple, it was on the eighth day. Do you remember that? That's why. Let's keep reading. Among you, every man child in your generations that is born in the house are bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So he's talking about those who were your, your natural born children, again, men, and also those who were your servants living in your home, again, men, would all be what? Circumcised. Verse 13, and he that is born in thy house, that he that is born with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So that was a sign in the male, on the flesh of the male. Why the male? Because the male carried what? The seed. And the generations were the product of the seed. Do you see that? So God was making the covenant with the generation present and the generations to come. Let's read one more verse there. Look at verse 14. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be what? Cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now here's the deal. The breaking of the covenant with God was what? The penalty for breaking the covenant was death. So any male 
who was born as a Jew or born in the household, perhaps as a servant, and was not circumcised, they'll, be die. they'll die. Why? Because she broke the covenant. So when, we, so when we talk about circumcision now, that's the point where circumcision was initiated. It was initiated by who? God. It was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and his seed. Does that make sense to you? All right. So, uh, again, reading the, the, the note, the cutting of the foreskin of every Jewish male child and servant who was part of the household. It was a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants. True circumcision was the believer whose, whose spirit was changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what, so what Paul was saying here back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, for we are the circumcision. What is he saying there? We are the circumcision. He's saying to, again, he's addressing the, the church there. He's saying there's a new order now. That old order that God had established with Abraham was an order that was to lead to something bigger. That sign that was in the mail was literally a sign that was saying that one day there would be a true circumcision and that circumcision would come about on the, on the spirits of people. What does that mean? It meant that the Holy Spirit would move on the spirits of people and change their spirits and they would be reunited with God. Oh, isn't that good? Amen. That's the born again experience. So circumcision pointed what? Pointed, it was a physical act, a physical sign that literally pointed to something that would happen one day that would be from a spiritual origin. People's spirits would be changed by the Holy Spirit. I submit to you this, that if a person is truly a Christian, truly born again, that is the work and power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only entity that can change the human heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, that is the distinction between what we refer to as Christianity and every religion in the world. Because every religion, every other religion is based on outward actions, outward um, uh, systems, things that you have to do, ways in which you have to think. Christianity is based on God himself by his spirit changing the heart of a person and making them somebody that they were not originally were. You follow what I'm saying? Circumcision. So Paul is referring to the Judaizers. He's saying they thought that they were of the circumcision, but they missed the point. Because the true circumcision are those who have experienced the power of the Spirit. The Bible declares in, in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, circumcision. He's a new creation. The old has been cut away by the power of the Holy Ghost, and the new has come. Listen, listen, if that has happened to you, your worst day is a good day. Amen. Your mediocre day is a good day. Amen. Your half step in the day is a good day. Amen. The day when people don't like you is a good day. Hallelujah. Because regardless to what happened, you're born again. Amen. Your future is set. Amen. Oh, man, I'm telling you, that's good stuff there. Are you still awake? So true circumcision is what? True circumcision is this power of the Holy Spirit that changes a human heart. And I'll say this. If your heart has been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, your desires change. Now let me, let me clarify something. It doesn't mean that you become perfect. But what it does mean is that you have a desire for God. Yes. See, I've I, 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 I met many people and they say they're born again but here's the thing that troubles me. They don't have a desire for God. They don't have a desire for the things of God. They don't have a desire for the word of God. They don't have a desire to, to get close to God. That is not indicative of somebody whose heart has been changed. Amen. One of the evidences of, of a heart being changed is that a person has a desire for God. They may slip and they may mess up, they may fall down, but on the inside there's a heart for God. I don't know how, but I want to know God. Are you listening to me? Listen, listen. The reason why you would come to a place like this on a night like this is because you obviously must have somehow, some way, some degree, a heart for God. Amen. <laughs> 
on a cold night like tonight, nobody's going to come to a place like this unless you have a heart for God. <laughs> okay, here's another term we need to look at. This term, and this is in your notes, flesh. What is flesh? When we talk about flesh, what are we talking about? Because the Bible talks a lot about, uses this term a lot, flesh. What is, what is flesh? Some people think well, it's just talking about the body. It's talking about the carnine, just the body, the meat. No, 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 no. Flesh is the human makeup. Flesh is, is all my desires, my, 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 my thoughts, my intentions, my, 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 my will, everything that I desire that's outside of God. That's flesh. So, so all the human thinking, all the ambition, ambition, all the drive, all the motivation, all that I want in and of myself, outside of God, I want it. It's flesh. You see, what, what we're going to learn is that the flesh in no way can please God. You see, that, that is, that is a, a baffling thought because most humans... We pride ourselves in what? Flesh. I mean, we, we like flesh. We cuddle flesh. We want you to cuddle flesh, our flesh. We want you to talk about how good we are and how, how you know, the world can't live without us and how we, 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 when we showed up, the whole world changed. And when we walk in a room, everything, we like, what is that? Flesh. Don't look at me like that. You know it's true. It's flesh. We deal with flesh every day. <laughs> verse 4. We're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. He goes on. Paul says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. Now we're going to get into some detail. He's going to give us some, some insight into this idea of flesh. Because one of the major uh, debacles or problems with humans is that when it comes to any issue pertaining to God, they want to bring flesh. They want to say, God, I'm going to come to you and approach you based on what I think. In fact, we live in a world today, and, and, and specific in our society, people, you, 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 anything when it comes to any religious issue, they'll say this. They'll say, first and foremost, I think. I think. I think. Don't have to have any basis for their thought. Don't have to have any, any conclusions that have, have, are based on uh, sturdy and, and observations and things that, that pertaining from truth. It's just the fact that I think. And if I think it, that's true. In fact, we live in a world today, people say, your truth is good for you. My truth is good for me. Whatever you think. Okay, so he goes, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So now he begins to break this down. Paul is now, here's the notes, Paul now is addressing the Judaizers' claim that in order to be saved, one had to keep the ceremonies and rituals of the Mosaic law. Paul uses his own lofty attainments in Judaism, which superseded what most of the Jews could attain, to prove that any and all attempts of humans to try and satisfy the holy standards of God were a complete waste. So now Paul is going to go into, he, he, he's trying to reason with these people and these Judaizers, because here's the thing about Judaizers, again, they were all wrapped up in their ability to keep the rules that were laid down by the Mosaic law. Yeah. Their, 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 their point of reference was, if I can keep these rules, it, makes, it means that I'm good enough as a person. Yeah. Now, we're looking at from, just from the standpoint of Judaism, but we're going to bring this into the context of, of our, where we live today. Because I'll say this to you. See, if I think because of my ministry, of the fact that I study the Bible, the, the, the fact that I pray, the fact that I do these kinds of things makes me acceptable under God. I'm just like the Judaizers. If I think what I do makes God like me, I'm just like the Judaizers. 
And see, here's the thing. Let me say this real carefully. Many of our churches are filled with people who are Judaizers because they think their performance causes God to like them. And the Bible gives us a completely different reality. We can't do anything to get God to like us. It was only what Jesus did is what causes God to like us. Oh, that's good stuff there. Let's look at this breakdown, what Paul is talking about. In verse 5, he says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now let's break that down a little bit. Let's look at some notes. He starts off, first of all, talking about what? Talking about, Paul starts off by proving that he was full blooded Jew. So when he uses this term now, he uses this term circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Well, what does that mean? It means that because he was a Jew, he was circumcised on the eighth day because that was the way that they kept what? The covenant. I know it's cold outside, but that don't mean your brain has to be cold. So you can still think. <laughs> So, when he, when he says here in verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day, what is he referring to? He's referring to the covenant, right? Because on the eighth day, the male child, Jewish, in the Jewish household, had to be what? Circumcised. So he's saying that for what reason? He's saying that proves I was a Jew. Is that okay? All right. Let's go on. He uses, he says the next term, he uses this phrase, the tribe of Benjamin. What's the significance with the tribe of Benjamin? Well, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, Benjamin was one of Rachel's sons, which proves that that's in the lineage of the Abrahamic covenant. Very good. Right? Are you with me? Okay, just trying to, trying to see here. You're kind of low there. Um, so, and then here's the other thing. Because he was of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was one of those honorable tribes because what we find back in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, if you, those of you who studied with me, you understand that there was a, a division because there were 12 tribes and those 12 tribes became a nation and under David, they were solidified as a very strong nation. Then David's son, Solomon, uh, made them even more prominent and they became, they were probably one of the most strongest nations on, on earth and, and, and one of the richest. But Solomon, because of his, his wisdom and, and his love for women, he turned his heart away from God. I should say the women helped turn his heart away from God. And so God said, Solomon, because you've done this, I'm going to rip the nation away from you. And so Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was left with not 12 tribes, but two tribes. And those two tribes were Judah and Benjamin. The 10 tribes were led away by a man by the name of Jeroboam. They became what we refer to now as Israel. And so you have Judah and Israel, but here's the thing. Benjamin, being that second tribe, and they were referred to as the southern uh, nation, Benjamin stayed faithful to the Davidic lineage. Judah and Benjamin. Now, Jesus Christ came from what tribe? Judah. Get it? Judah, Benjamin, stayed faithful to the Davidic lineage. So if one came from the tribe of Benjamin, he was heralded as somebody because he was from that, what, committed tribe. He was a royal, a royal Davidic heritage. You follow what I'm saying? That's why he says that. Now listen, when you, ever, when you see that again, now you'll know why he said that, right? Of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, let's move on. What, is this, what else does he say? 
a Hebrew of Hebrews. What does that mean? A Hebrew of Hebrews. It meant this. It meant that Paul, he was of Hebrew parents. That, that's important, right? That means that you're pure-blooded, right? Real Hebrew, not mixed, right? But not only that, because you understand that the, that the, the Israelites were dispersed into different nations. They lived under heathen nations. But here's the thing about, about Paul. He, was, he and his family refused to adopt the customs of the heathen nations where they lived. They maintained their Jewish traditions and customs. Now, many Israelites, when they moved into these areas, for instance, here's a case in point, when, when, they, when they were taken to Babylon, some of the Israelites assimilated into the Babylonian culture. They forgot their language. They spoke the Babylonian language. They ate the Babylonian food. They engrossed themselves in the Babylonian customers. In other words, customs, in other words, they became Babylonians. Paul wasn't like that. His family refused to change. Now, what does that speak in regards to his nation? He speaks, that speaks to him as being one of those who are what? Committed Jews. So he uses the term Hebrew of Hebrews. Does that make sense to you? So when you see that term Hebrew of Hebrews, now you know why he said it. Does that make sense to you? He was one who did not let the culture around him change him. He chose to stay committed to Judaism. Okay. A Pharisee. What's, what's the deal? Because he, he, because he throws this in there. What's, what's the deal about being a Pharisee? Well, the Pharisees, they were those who, um, they kept the law of Moses, but not just keeping the law of Moses. They wanted to do it so well. They added hundreds of rules to it. They made it so complex and made it so detailed and made it so meticulous that it was literally almost impossible for anybody to do it. But they did it because they wanted to jack it up to a higher standard. So he's saying, I not only just kept the law, I went over and above it. You imagine that. 613 principles that were in the mosaic when you, when you move from um, the book of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then you have the Pharisees. They added hundreds of more rules. So he says, I'm a Pharisee. Now see, what he's doing is he's, he's, he's trumping the Judaizers. He's saying, you think you're Jews? You don't even know what Jews do. You don't know what they are. I was in the elite class of Jews. I was above everybody else. That's what he's saying. You still away? Okay. Then he talks about zeal in persecuting the church. Why does he bring that up? Because here's the thing. In Judaism, zeal was a major issue. Judaism was not based on just, you know, you couldn't just think, okay, well, I believe that so that I'm just going to be settled in the fact I believe that's good enough. No, in Judaism, you had to act it out. And those who act out what they believe were considered those who were in that elite class. Now, Paul, when he, when he talks about this idea of persecuting the church, here's the thing about Judaism. Judaism hated anything that oppose the system of the Mosaic law in their minds. And see, so here's the thing. When they saw Jesus, and they saw him, because in, in the mind of the Jew, you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, where it says, Here is the Lord our God is one. And then Jesus comes on the scene and says, He's God. And in their mindset, for, for thousands of years, they have, they have uh, uttered the Shema, which is uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord, hero is the Lord our God, is one God. He's only one. And then Jesus shows up and says, I am God. And so they became infuriated with that. And then on top of that, he, he, he's, he's crucified the most humiliating death to a Jew that could be died, to be tortured and humiliated on a cross. 
And then to have people, after Jesus supposedly did, to have people to come along and say, he's alive and we're his followers and we're preaching his message, it enraged people like Paul. Hence, he set out to kill every one of them. So he's saying, if you want to measure my zeal, I was the lead person in persecuting the church. You want to see zeal? Because Paul goes on to say, he doesn't say it here, but if you, you read his life and his ministry and, and even prior to his conversion, you find out that he tortured people. He killed people. No, it doesn't give any numbers. We don't know how many. But here's the thing. There are men and women, moms and dads, that, that children were without their moms or dads. Why? Because of Paul. Because these were Christian parents, and he killed them. He tortured them. So when he, makes, when he says these things, these are not just things you read across. They have meaning in what he's saying. Then he goes on to say the righteousness of the law. Here's the thing. He's referring now back to this law of Moses. And he's saying, I kept it all. I kept it all. Now when he said that, he's saying, I kept it in my flesh. I kept the outward actions. But here's the thing. You can keep something from the outside is only religion. If it's not in the heart, in the spirit, there's no life there. And so Paul, he kept it with his, his, his human ability. He didn't even recognize that he was completely outside of the heart and life of God. Okay, let's move on. Let me, I'm just going to read this. In his actions, Paul was able to keep the external requirements of the Mosaic law. Internally, he was a legalist filled with pride and deceit. He was lost and an enemy of God. Lost and an enemy of God. Now, he goes on there in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Here we go. What is he saying? He's saying that everything, because all these things that I did, I did in the flesh. Now, what does that mean? It means that I did it out of human ability, human will, human ambition, human drive. And here's the thing. This is why when we talk about the cross of Christ, it is so important for us to understand. Listen, was, did any human being other than Jesus Christ die on the, on the cross on, in, in regards to dying for the humanity? No, no, no. Why not? Because no human being qualified. In order for humanity to, to receive redemption or to be acceptable unto God, there had to be a human die, but the human had to be perfect. Where are you going to find a perfect human? They didn't exist. So God had to come die. So he wrapped himself in, in human flesh and came to the earth and he died for humanity. But see, what does that say? It is a statement now that humanity cannot in and of itself save itself. So nothing that I can do in and of myself can save me eternally. It is ludicrous to think that I as a human being can be good enough to work myself into heaven. And most of the world, outside of the knowledge of the gospel, that's exactly what they're trying to do. Just like Paul and his ability in his strong will, his strong constitution, to be able to keep the law based on external factors you have people today that are trying, based on external factors, what they can do to gain a right to heaven. Let me say something to you. As a believer, you are only a believer if you are a believer and truly born again. 
because of what Jesus Christ did in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. You can never think that your goodness, your cuteness, <laughs> gains you any point with God. Now listen, listen, let me, let me say this to you. Uh, those of us in ministry have to constantly remind ourselves of this point because the flesh is something that likes to rile up. And, and see, when you function, even in ministry, this is why a, a, a man or woman's prayer life is so important because you can so easily start looking at what you have done. Listen, here's the reality. You and I are vessels. If you were born again, you are a vessel. And God's will is, is to pour himself in you and work through you as a vessel. And any good that comes out of that gives the glory comes to God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now listen, that message, as basic as it is, is almost lost. Because even in the context of the church, you had the parade of flesh in many regards. We can earn nothing, we can do nothing, we are nothing. That's why the Bible says quite plainly, we were created for God's pleasure. Amen. Listen, mm -hmm. you were not put on this earth to live out of self. Self is the result of the fall of man. Amen. We were put on this earth to be vessels that God could work through. And see, this is, this is why we have this, as I close tonight, this is why we have this, this prayer emphasis. What does prayer do? Prayer brings us into the mindset of humility. True prayer does. You begin to see yourself empty and hopeless without a loving God. That's what Paul said, I have to die daily. What do you mean by that? I have to remind flesh that it's because of Jesus. I can't take any credit for it. It's because of Jesus. Stand with me. As we stand tonight, thank you so much for being such a good audience. Good and quiet. <laughs> but I trust, I trust tonight, we've got down to verse 7 in chapter 3. So we are moving, moving slow, but we are moving. But as we leave tonight, listen, listen, this is something that we, we must, and this is why Paul said at the beginning of this chapter, he says, I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not concerned at all about reminding you about this. What is he talking about? He's talking about this, that, that we must be constantly reminded that God gets all the glory. Amen. See, this is why we come on a night like this, and before we even have study, what do we do? We have time of what? Praise and worship. Why? Because that helps us stay in the mode of understanding God gets the glory. We have to understand, listen, listen, listen. If, if you stop breathing, what can you do? I mean, as, as basic human beings, if you don't breathe, what, you won't do anything. It's the grace of God that we breathe. Amen. So the reality is that we stand here as people, and, and it's simply because of what Jesus has done for us. Amen. And the recognition is, is that we have no value in and of ourselves, and if we think we do, we are deceived. Yes. So tonight, 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 as we close tonight, maybe there's somebody who, here who's never made the ultimate co commitment to G of Jesus Christ to their life, making themselves, giving themselves to Jesus Christ. Maybe there are people in this room that perhaps you have, you're trying to please God out of your works. You're thinking in terms of what I can do. Maybe you're, there are people here tonight, you're running your own life. You're all about what you can do. And here, here's, here's, here's the value of real life. Here it is. When you close your eyes for the last time, which all of us will one day, what will be the value? See, as a believer, you get to live for the purposes of eternity. Amen. That which you do now counts forever. Amen. But if you live only for now, it counts for nothing. 
in regards to eternity. So it's good to get your priorities right. It's the first month of the Gregorian calendar, right? It's good to get your priorities right. Why don't you just, if you would, would you just close your eyes and just, just take a moment. I'm going to let you go. I won't keep you too much longer. Let's be close tonight. Would you in all honesty, would you be willing, and just in your own way, in your own heart, would you be willing to say, I willingly submit myself to your Lordship, Jesus. I understand I can't save myself. I understand that I'm a human being. I've been placed on this earth really to glorify you, to allow you to live out your purpose through me. And we get so caught up many times because of the voices of the world, the voices of media, the voices of entertainment that sort of draws us in and we begin to think that it's all about us and what we can do. And sometimes we think just because we do these things, I must be good with God. Just because I'm in ministry, I must be good with God. Lord, May the Holy Spirit so impress upon us the truth of your word tonight. May we be willing to understand and yield the reality that you are Lord. And we bow to your Lordship. We thank you for that which Jesus has accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection because we understand that, we are, that that is the only way we have a, a stance of righteousness with you. That is the only way that we have access. Thank you for what Jesus did. Thank you that we have peace because of what he has done, what he has accomplished. And Lord, we rest in that. We rest in it. Now, our life on earth is about knowing you. Amen. We read our Bibles not because it's a performance, but we are getting to know you. We pray not because it's performance, but because we're getting to know you. We minister not because we're performing, but because it's a way in which we get to know you. Lord, may this work deep in our hearts. May it be real. In Jesus' name, for your glory, for your honor. Amen. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the most high God. Well, God bless you tonight. Good night to you. Have a safe drive home.